Well, this morning is a general session where I want to talk about this, this issue of Noah's flood and the age of the earth being the crucial watershed issue in this origins debate. And it's the reason why this is a crucial issue to discuss in our apologetics in our, uh, and arm ourselves and equip ourselves to answer the challenges of the age that we face. Let's define the problem. We often are told that evolution is happening so slowly today that we can't see it happening. Have you heard that? I mean, we don't see fish growing legs and becoming frogs, and so they say, well, we don't see it happening today because it's happening so slowly. So let's define our terms because, you see, the term evolution is actually misused so very much. If someone says to you, um, I can see evolution, evolution is happening, I believe in evolution, you should ask them, what do you mean by evolution? Because so often what they mean is different varieties of dogs or different varieties of finches on the Galapagos Islands, you know, big beaks, little beaks. And on the Galapagos Islands, you have finches with big beaks and little beaks, but they're still finches, aren't they? They haven't changed into something else. And so you have to ask people, what do you mean by evolution? Well, they're talking about small changes, small changes in living things. But they're trivial, aren't they? And they're only within what we call the biblical kinds because the Bible doesn't talk about species. It talks about the kinds. And so you've got the dog kind, you've got the cat kind, and there's lots of variation. In fact, God made things with such amazing ability to vary because he just loves varieties. I mean, look at all the flowers that we can enjoy, the different animals that we enjoy. You know, you've got your, your favorite pet dog and I've got my favorite pet dog and God has given us all this variety so that we can enjoy his creation. But those small changes are not evolution. And, and we agree that there are small changes happening today. So what we really mean by the term evolution, or what they try to extrapolate from the small changes is the big changes, okay? Because the real idea of evolution is those big changes where life developed spontaneously, we're told, from nothing. Matter came from nowhere and chemicals combined to form life and the first cell developed through time via these big changes, new body plans, the body plan of a fish changing to the body plan of a frog changing to the body plan. So, you know, those are the big changes that evolution is really all about. So we call that molecules to man evolution. That's why it's so important to ask people to define what they mean by evolution because then you can agree with them that small changes do happen and but push the argument over to molecules to man, the big changes, which we don't see happening today. So we definitely can't see, cannot see these required big changes. We don't see fish growing legs to become amphibians or the lungs and scale of a rep, scales of a reptile becoming the lung and feathers of a bird. We do not see those changes. So how do the evolutionists cope with this problem? Because it is a real problem to them when they don't see the big changes that they require. Well, there's two escape mechanisms that they use. And this is why this issue of the age of the Earth is important, because the first mechanism that is uh, to overcome this fatal problem to their molecules to man idea is this one, the fossil record. They appeal to the fossil record saying it contains examples of the needed in-between kinds or transitional forms. So they can't see fish growing legs and becoming frogs today, but maybe it happened in the past and the fossil record is supposed to be a record of past life. Well, it's not really, actually. It's a burial mound. It's a graveyard of dead things. And, and when you look at the fossils, you don't see a living environment. All you see is a graveyard. 
It all depends on your perspective, your glasses. With biblical glasses, it's abundant evidence of Noah's flood. All the billions of dead things buried in rock lies laid down by water all over the earth. And so they appeal to the fossil record to provide these missing links or transitional forms. So, for example, they point to fragments of incomplete fossilised skeletons. Of course, they're missing the soft parts. You don't see, always see the anatomy or other crucial features. And so they point to these fossilised, incomplete fossilised skeletons as transitional creatures. I mean, there was a big hoo-ha recently about a fossil called Ida, wasn't there? A lemur-like creature that was supposed to be on the branch leading up to monkeys and ape-like creatures and man. And there was a lot of fanfare about it. But you see, have you kept on hearing about that fossil? No, after the first few days of fanfare, it all died away. Because you see, what happens is that these missing leaks are incomplete and fragmentary. They're missing vital details, and you don't find these transitions. They hope and believe that these transitional forms will eventually be found. They hope and believe, and that's why when they find something, they hail it with great fanfare, and then it's later relegated to false hope. And of course, that's what happened with Ida, because even the scientific community said that the, all the hoo-ha and fanfare was unjustified. And that repeats. Just wait another six months and they'll announce some new fossil. And everyone gets all excited and that, that's designed to make the public think that they've found the missing link, they've found the transitional form. Well, they haven't. See, Charles Darwin admitted in 1859, why then is not every geological formation, every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. The explanation lies, as I believe, says Darwin, in the extreme imperfection of the geologic record. Notice what he's saying. We can't find them, therefore we haven't yet found enough fossils and, you know, just maybe we're not digging in the right place and, you know, it's, it's only a chance or accident that a fossil might be formed and therefore the geologic record is imperfect. Well, that was 1859. Stephen Jay Gould, the late Stephen Jay Gould from Harvard University, admitted in 1977, all paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. <laughs> what does he mean by that? You don't find those missing links. And that makes sense from a biblical perspective because this creature was buried and then that creature was buried. Stephen Gould also said in 1980, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions in organic design, indeed our inability, even in our imagination, to construct functional intermediates in many cases, in many cases has been a persistent and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. What's he saying? We can't even imagine what they look like. Elsewhere he said, what use is half a wing or half a jaw? I mean, a creature that's got legs changing into wings can neither walk well nor fly very well, so natural selection will eliminate it. End of story. And uh, David Raup, when he wrote uh, in 1979, well, we are now about 120 years after Darwin and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. The record of evolution is still surprisingly jerky and ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. How many did Darwin have? None. <laughs> so that's not a very good case, is it? Some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. So you see, they've got a flimsy case, haven't they? And yet they keep on trumpeting these new fossils as if they're going to provide the missing link. Colin Patterson uh, was quoted uh, in, in um, Luther Sunderland's book from a letter that he'd written in answer to questions. He'd published a book on evolution 
And uh, this is what he commented. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolution transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. Yet Gould and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional forms. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. You see, the, the scientists who are in the know, who are the, the ones who study the fossils, when you really talk to them, they will admit the, the problems they have in substantiating their claims about macroevolution, molecules to man, and the evidence in the fossil record. Well, as Mark Ridley says, paleontologists disagree about the speed and pattern of evolution, but they do not, as much as recent publicity has implied, doubt that evolution is a fact. It's based on no evidence, but it's a fact. <laughs> I'd call it a, a faith. The, the evidence for evolution simply does not depend on the fossil record. Oh, that's interesting news. We've all been told it depends on these fossils. In any case, no real evolutionist, whether gradualist or punctualist, uses a fossil record as evidence in favour of the theory of evolution as opposed to special creation. We'll tell that to the college and high school students because the fossils are always trumpeted as the supposed evidence for evolution. So that's escape mechanism number one. But what's escape mechanism number two? Here it is, millions of years. Because you see, they say, what you don't see happen today, given enough time, it probably happens. See, they appeal to these supposed millions of years to have produced what we can't see happening today. Even though all that supposed geological time has not preserved any, any transitional fossils. There's an arm waving. We can't see it happening today. But, you know, go to the geologists and, and there's been plenty of time and just maybe it happened in all those millions of years. And so you can see why the millions of years are important. In fact, time is regarded as the hero of the plot. Evolution is firmly built on the millions of years scenario because without enough time, evolution is impossible. And we have to respond by saying there is no time. There is no time. Therefore, evolution is impossible. It never happened. See, this is why, exactly why this millions of years age issue is the pivotal and central issue that we face today. It's the battleground, even sadly, amongst Christians. So many Christian academics I meet, this is the issue. They say, all right, I don't believe in evolution, but I believe in an old earth. They do not stand on the authority of God's word that the record we have is that the earth is young and there was a global catastrophic flood year long that produced all the fossils. They won't give ground to evolution, but they compromise on the age issue. What they don't realise is evolution and millions of years go hand in hand and ultimately they are compromising with evolution. The uh, late George Wald, who was a professor at Harvard University, wrote this in Scientific American. This was back in 1954. Time is, in fact, the hero of the plot. The time which we have to deal with is the order of two billion years. By the way, since 1954, the age of the Earth has expanded to four and a half billion years. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. You see what great faith the evolutionist has? I mean, we have a reasonable faith that is rooted in God's word. Who has the more reasonable faith? Well, you know, the Apostle Peter actually predicted that this would happen. We need to be reminded what the Apostle Peter warned us about. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder 
that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. This word remember, Peter uses in both his letters. Remember and its variants, reminder and be mindful. Why did Peter do that? Because Peter knew the penalty for forgetting. He knew what happens when you forget the warnings of the Lord. He knew that we are prone to forget. In fact, when you read the scriptures, time and time again, God repeats, repeats, repeats. The children of Israel were always reminded to turn back to the Lord because they forgot the words of the Lord. They forgot to keep the law of the Lord. That's why we need to remember what God wrote. And in Matthew, we remember on, in the life of Peter, Jesus warned Peter that he would betray his Lord. And Peter swore with oaths and curses that he'd never deny his Lord. And yet what happened? He denied his Lord three times and he remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will die, deny me three times. Then he went out and wept bitterly. He knew from personal experience the problem, the, the penalty, the pain of forgetting God's word. You see, God has given us his word to remind us of his works in creation and in history. The book of Genesis is the foundational history of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? It's where his lineage starts and it leads all the way to the cross. It is vital. It is the history of our Lord Jesus Christ. His earthly history begins in the book of Genesis. Now, back in Joshua's day, we read of this episode when the children of Israel crossed over the River Jordan to the Promised Land. And as they, they went through the waters of Jordan, a leader from each of the tribes was commanded through, by God through Joshua to take a stone from the bed of the river and they were to put a pile of stones at their camp in Gilgal. And we read, and this may be, that, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask you in time to come saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be a memorial, a reminder to the children of Israel forever. Friends, the fossils are a reminder that God means business, that God will judge and they are there for a purpose. The rocks cry out that God is our creator and our judge. You know, it saddens me. I've heard preachers who say that this wasn't really a miracle. You know, there was just, a, there was just a, a, an earthquake and a landslide and it blocked the River Jordan and, and they went over. Well, notice in Joshua 4 that the Jordan River was in flood. It had a lot of mud when it was in flood. And what do we read? We read that this was definitely a miracle. Why? Because the children of Israel crossed over on dry ground. It wasn't muddy ground, it was dry ground. That was the miracle, that God cut off the waters when they were in flood, when they were muddy, and the people didn't have to wade through the mud. It was instantly dry. And he wanted to remember to be reminded of that miracle. Now, what could be more important than the words of Jesus? Because Peter says here, he wants us to be mindful of what the prophets said, which was in the Old Testament scriptures, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour, to remember what Jesus taught, what Jesus did. What could be more important than those two things? Well, Peter, in his second epistle, his third chapter, this is, he knows he's about to depart, and this is his final word. And he says this, something that is even more important, yes, even more important in a sense. He says this, knowing this first, first of all, above everything else I've already told you, that scoffers will come in the last days 
walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter warned that there would come scoffers who would deny God's word and it would be on this question of time. They would deny that Jesus Christ is coming again because they will say that all things have continued on and on and on and on and on over millions of years in the past. God is irrelevant to time. Therefore, what are you Christians talking about Jesus Christ coming again? He says, for this they willfully forget, or some translations say deliberately forget, or are willingly ignorant. Notice that? You see, the one thing you find out when you talk to people, it really isn't a matter of the evidence. You can throw all amount of evidence at them, but it never changes their minds. Why? Because their heart, first of all, needs to be changed. This is a spiritual issue. That's why we must always remember that the evidence is a means to an end. Because what their problem ultimately is spiritual, they need to hear the gospel which will change their hearts and will change their minds. Because they have deliberately forgotten, they have chosen to forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. You see, they will deliberately deny that in the beginning God created and that God subsequently judged with a catastrophic global flood. It's not that the evidence isn't there for the geologists to see. They have deliberately chosen to ignore it because to admit that God created, to admit that God judged, means that you and I have to submit to our creator. And man has always been in a rebellion against God since the Garden of Eden. So he chooses automatically to rebel. And he does so mentally as well as spiritually. You see, the last day scoffers will, be willfully, will willfully forget that God created the heavens and the earth, as Peter says here, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, literally the earth com was compacted out of the water and made to stand up above the water, which of course is a clear reference to the third day of creation, where God gathered the waters together into one place and made the dry land appear, literally compacted the land from out of those waters. And they will willfully forget that God judged the world with a watery cataclysm the Greek word used is cataclysmos, from which we get our English word cataclysm, and everything perished, which of course is a clear reference to Genesis 6 through 9, the flood. They will justify their denial of God, their godless behavior, believing all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You see, we're told that they will walk after their own lusts. Why? Because if they deny that God exists, they can make up their own rules and behave how they want to. If God doesn't exist, there are no rules, therefore we can do our own thing. Do we see that happening today? Of course we do. And it is rooted in this belief that all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. It is rooted in this belief in the millions of years. That is the compromise that allows them to deny God and to behave in a godless manner. And yet the church is silent on this issue by and large. The church has been asleep for 200 years and hasn't heeded the warning that Peter gave in this second epistle, chapter 3. And it's about time we woke up. You see, these last day scoffers began back in the 1700s. James Hutton was a Scottish doctor turned farmer and geologist, and he published a book, Theory of the Earth, in 1795, in which he said, no powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action admitted except those of which we know the principle. The past history of our globe must, must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. 
I see no vestige of a beginning or prospect of an end. You see what he's saying? He's saying we should only explain the past in terms of the rates of processes we see happening today. And his ideas were taken up by a lawyer by the name of Charles Lyell. A lawyers have got a lot to answer for, haven't they? <laughs> but he was a lawyer turned geologist. And this year marks the 200th anniversary of the establishment of the Geological Society of London. And he was one of the nine that first established that geological society. And in his book, Principles of Geology, which was published in 1830, 1833, it ran through uh, three volumes and it ran through about 13 editions. He wrote that he, he, in this book, that he advocated only present day processes at present day rates of intensity are needed to interpret the geologic record. Now, he didn't invent the term, the present is the, is the key to the past. It was actually an American geologist that coined that term. But nonetheless, it's a good way to understand what Charles Lyell and the scoffers were promoting. That only the present can be used to understand the past. Now, Charles Lyell was actually had a spiritual agenda. We know that from his writings. He saw himself as the spiritual saviour of geology, freeing it from the old dispensation of Moses. You see, Lyle wasn't an objective, dispassionate observer. He was on a spiritual crusade to remove the Bible from consideration in geology. It didn't matter what the rock showed, he was going to impose his views on the rocks. He sought to explain the whole rock record by only slow, gradual processes so as to reduce the flood to a geologic non-event. And he was very cunning about the way he did this. To begin with, in his first edition, he didn't outright deny Noah's flood because, you see, he wanted to draw in the church to accept his view. So he didn't outright deny Noah's flood to begin with. It's only in the later editions of his book that he completely ignored Noah's flood altogether. He rejected the scriptures and deliberately to set, set out to undermine their authority. This is a letter he wrote to the, one of the geology, he, uh, Murchison was a professor of geology at Oxford. He said this, I trust I shall make my sketch of progress of geology popular. Old Fleming, referring to a minister, a reverend, is frightened and thinks the age will not stand my anti-mosaical conclusions. In a letter to a parliamentarian, George Scropey, he wrote this, I'm sure you may get into QR, which is a geological publication, what will free the science of geology from Moses. But all I say is there are, as Hutton said, no signs of a beginning, no prospect of an end. Well, was Charles Darwin a dispassionate observer when he went around the, the Beagle, on the be voyage of the Beagle around the world? Absolutely not. What book did Charles Lyell have with him on the Beagle? Lyell's Principles of Geology. And so by the time he was a few weeks into the voyage, he'd read the book and he was converted to Lyell's ideas of gradualism and uniformitarian geology. And we can see that from his journal entries. You see, uh, Darwin actually made more geological observations on that voyage than he did biological. Most people don't realise that. He was more of a geologist than he was a biologist. And he imbibed Charles Lyell's ideas of slow and gradual processes. So he wrote in his, journal, his Voyage of the Beagle journal these words, guided by principles of geology, referring to Lyell's book, and having under my view the vast changes on, in, on this, in this continent, going on in this continent. See, he was down in South America. And by the time he started making his geological observations, you read his further journal entries, he was already talking about millions of years of slow and gradual processes. He wasn't an unbiased observer. This is what he, he wrote in uh, The Origin. 
in 1859, it is hardly possible for me to recall to the reader who is not a practical geologist the facts, I emphasize that word and I'll come back to it shortly, leading the mind to feebly comprehend the lapse of time. He who can read Sir Charles Lyell's grand work on the principles of geology, which the future historian will recognize as having produced a revolution in natural science, well, it certainly did that, produced a revolution, and yet does not admit how vast has been the, vast, the past periods of time, may at once close this volume, referring to the origin of species. He built his origin of species on the millions of years. He built it on Charles Lyell's rejection of God's word and believing that all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, just as Peter had warned on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit 1,800 years earlier. And the church missed it. The church missed the warning. Charles Darwin went on to write, we can best gain some idea of past time by knowing the agencies at work, the thickness of our sedimentary formations, the rock layers. Therefore, a man should examine the great piles of superimposed rock layers or strata and watch the rivulets bringing down mud in order to comprehend something about the durations of past time. See, looking at present day processes of rivers slowly eroding the countryside and assuming that that's the way rivers have always flowed, that's the way sedimentary rock layers have formed, well, of course you get millions of years if you do it that way. This is what he wrote. And I want you to grasp this point. And I'm going to just explain a little bit further in a moment. But he wrote this again in the origin. In all parts of the world, the piles of sedimentary strata are of wonderful thickness. Professor Ramsey has given me the maximum thickness of the successive formation in different parts of Great Britain. And there he's got the numbers of the different groups of rock layers. 57,000 feet, 13,000 feet, 2,000 feet. So when you add all that up, making all together 72,000 feet thickness of rock layers in Great Britain, nearly 13 and three quarter miles. Between successive formations, we have in the opinion, it's not observed, but in the opinion of most geologists, blank periods of enormous length. So that this lofty pile gives but an inadequate idea of the time elapsed during its accumulation. The consideration of these facts, are they really facts? impresses the mind in the same manner as does the vain endeavour to grapple with the idea of eternity. What Charles Darwin did, he looked at an area of southern England, for example, south of, of London, you can see it on this map, where there was originally a large uh, mountain area. And based on his calculations of how much was eroded away, and looking at how slowly things erode today, he calculated a rate of an erosion of half an inch per 100 years, so he came up with the idea that it took 306 million years to erode this area south of London. So you see where the millions of years came from? It didn't come from radioactive decay in rocks. It was well established, well before that. What do we mean by this idea, all things continue, this phrase that the Apostle Peter uses in 2 Peter chapter 3? This is the belief in the uniformity of natural processes, this belief that now underpins all of modern geology. The way it works is simple to understand, as you would have already grasped, or should have, from those quotes from Charles Darwin. So, for example, layers of sand are deposited by rivers today in their deltas. The Ohio River is taking down sand and mud down to the Mississippi, which goes down to the delta. And, of course, it's slow and gradual. You get occasional flooding. Uh, I've been here when the Ohio River has burst its banks a little bit. You get occasional floods and get a little bit more mud and sand carried. So we might be good scientists and measure down there in the Mississippi Delta that it takes 100 years to deposit one foot, a one-foot-thick sand layer down there at the mouth of the Mississippi River, okay? 100 years for one foot. Thus, if we see a 100-foot-thick layer of sandstone up in the Appalachian Mountains, using the idea that that sandstone layer was similarly deposited in the past as we see the Mississippi eroding the countryside today, so assuming the present is the key to the past, 
How long would it take to make that 100-foot layer of sandstone? 100 years for one foot, 10,000 years for 100 feet. See, that's where they got the idea of millions of years from. It was all a belief in the millions of years of slow and gradual process. It was a belief that deliberately rejected God's word about a global catastrophic flood. It was nothing to do with what was in the rocks. It was all to do about what was imposed on the rocks. A faith, a belief, an anti-God belief that was imposed on the rocks. You see, the total thickness of sedimentary layers in some places is measured in miles. You've got about a mile thickness in the walls of the Grand Canyon and another two miles above that up to Bryce Canyon. And so that's where the, first, the millions of years were first calculated, from the slow and gradual, supposed slow and gradual deposition of these sedimentary layers. Well... How did they compromise the authority of God's word? This belief is a deliberate rejection of the record in God's word of the global cataclysmic Genesis flood. Lyle's stated agenda was to remove the flood from the, any recognition in geology, and he actively campaigned in a subtle manner to achieve this. Yet it was, he was only successful because so many church leaders of the time had already compromised on the authority of God's word. The idea of millions of years was already commonly believed in, but now the rock layers provided the justification. Lyle won the battle because the church had already compromised. They had placed human reasoning alone above the authority of God's word. And that's the danger. I meet so many academics, and what they do is they place man's ideas above the authority of God's word, willingly or unwittingly. And what's happened? As a result of these ideas, the day, age and gap theories are not new, they've been around for a long time, they were deliberately proposed, as was the local flood idea, to reinterpret the text of scripture to fit in the supposed millions of years. Lyle rejected the authority of the scripture as God's reliable eyewitness account of Earth's history in favour of human reasoning. Human reasoning then and today insists that today's natural processes are the only scientific explanation for gradually producing the Earth's rock layers and landscapes. Now, what about these facts? The facts, quote unquote, supposedly, supposed facts that can be seen ultimately take precedence over the God-given statements of Scripture. In other words, for many Christians today, science always trumps Scripture. How sad. How sad. What do they mean by the word evidence anyway? The, these, these facts and data and evidence get, get bandied around. You know, when I get a, a new scientific paper which makes some claim, the first question I ask is, what assumptions are they using? because the assumptions will show you what the interpretation is. You'll be able to strip that away and find out what the real facts are, because what most scientists mean by evidence is not raw, cold, observable facts. It's actually the objects plus interpretation, which is based on assumptions. So many Christians get hoodwinked into thinking that there's powerful evidence against God's word. But the evidence that they're talking about is interpretation laden. You have to strip away the interpretation to see what the ultimate facts really are. And when you do that, you find the ultimate observable facts are not in conflict with God's word because they've imposed a belief system on what we observe in the rocks. To give you an example of a recent book published by Davis Young, and Ralph Steely, who were at uh, Calvin College in Michigan, no matter how many scripture verses they, referring to young earth creationists, throw at the rocks, the evidence for the earth's vast antiquity is there, it is diverse, it is voluminous, and it will not vanish. What does he mean by evidence? He means facts that have been interpreted. He goes up, they go on, the data of the Bible primarily tell human beings what to believe concerning God. 
Geologic data are just as much a reality, just as true as any statement in the Bible. Any geological fact is just as much a fact as the fact that David was born, sorry, that you were born or that David was the king of Israel. What a mix up. Why is there a difference between ge geological observations and the existence of King David? We'll come to that in a moment. Young earth creationists in the flood, they say, flood geology have almost nothing to do with the totality of evidence from earth. See, we have to be beware of semantics because the data or evidence or facts in geology are not the same as the fact that David was the king of Israel. Why? Because David's kingly reign is a historic fact attested by eyewitnesses. Was anyone there to see the rocks form? No. So it can't be a fact. David's existence is a fact because we have God's revelation, plus we have eyewitnesses who saw him reign in Israel. You see, we have to be careful that so much of what people call evidence is actually interpretations. And we have to ask them, what do you mean by evidence? Stop playing the game of semantics. Evidence they, is really the object plus interpretation that is based on assumptions. Assumptions. And the basic assumption in geology today is the present is the key to the past. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The doubting Thomas syndrome that I refer to, I won't believe it unless I can see it and touch it. But it's by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. It's by faith, not by evidence. It's by faith we understand that God created Think about it, a resurrection of a human body is not a natural process, so it cannot be scientifically explained, can it? That's why Christ's resurrection is thus rejected and ignored by many as fanciful and irrelevant, because you can't prove it scientifically. Does Davis Young reject the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If he did, he wouldn't be a Christian. But he can no more prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a natural process then he can, can explain the rocks by natural processes and the fossils. See, Christ literally rose from the dead because we know he did. It's both attested by revelation and by eyewitnesses. There were those that saw that he was alive. It is also the core of our Christian faith. Is Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. That's why you'll have these scientists who'll, who'll certainly believe in the resurrection but their atheistic colleagues will say, well, why do you believe that? Because we can't scientifically prove it. Why don't you be consistent? If you think you can scientifically prove the rocks, then you've got to scientifically prove the resurrection. You see how inconsistent scientists like Davis Young are, are being. Well, what does the Bible say about creation and the flood? Genesis 1 to 11 is attested both as literal history both by revelation and by eyewitnesses. God saw that he'd, what he'd made. Noah saw what happened at the time of the flood. Every one of those events was experienced apart from the early part of creation by human eyewitnesses. Yet Christian geologists like Davis Young reject Noah's flood as a literal global cataclysmic event that totally reshaped, reshaped the earth's geology. They would rather accept the opinions of men than the revelation of the creator of the universe. How sad. This is what they say. Although a tiny fraction of geologic evidence might suggest a global flood, so they admit there's a possibility, if considered in complete isolation from wealth of other evidence, the overwhelming totality of evidence argues mightily against a global deluge. What do they mean by evidence? They mean facts that have been interpreted by millions of years, through a millions of years grid. Well, what did Peter predict? These scoffers will come in the last days walking after their own lusts. Where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They will willingly forget that God created and that God flooded the world. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, now exist, are kept in store by the same word, reserved for fire until the day of judgment. Two key absolute certainties here in this passage that Peter tells us about. First, is the coming judgment fire to, uh, by fire to be global? Absolutely yes. Was the creation of the world global? Absolutely yes. So, because Peter is comparing those two events with the flood, 
The flood must also have been global, otherwise the analogy breaks down. Furthermore, key certainly number two, will God supernaturally intervene with the coming global judgment by fire? Absolutely yes. Did God supernaturally intervene to create the world? Absolutely yes. Therefore, by analogy with the, other, the, the flood with these two events, God must also have supernaturally intervened during the flood. Absolutely. He closed the door. He remembered Noah. He preserved them in the ark. He made it all happen. He was supernaturally in control. The Bible says that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. The windows of heaven were open. The rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. The waters prevailed exceedingly for 150 days, five months. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Every living substance was destroyed, which is upon the face of the ground. Why can't Christian geologists like Davis Young simply read the scriptures and believe what God's word says? Because if they did, they would see the flood everywhere in the rocks around them. Was that a description of this event here? Could we have a local mountain covering flood? If the Bible's language means anything, it's had to be a global catastrophic flood. What are the implications of the global flood? The scripture's description has had to be a global cataclysm. Therefore, the present cannot be the key to the past. Do you, you realize that? Because we don't see a global flood today. See how cunning Satan is? He turns things around 180 degrees. Instead of the, the, the present being the key to the past, it's the past that's the key to the present. It's because of what happened in the past at the flood which explains the rocks and the fossils we see today. But Satan has turned it around 180 degrees. That's the subtlety of Satan. The past is actually the key to the present because the global flood emphatically ex explains all the fossil-bearing sediments and eroded uh, landscapes, as, as Ken is apt to say, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by waters all over the earth. It's there in abundance for all to see. What was Peter's view of the creation time frame? But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that one day with the laws of a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Is Peter equating each creation day to a thousand years? Absolutely not. He was referring to Psalm 90 verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it has passed. See, we need to remember that God is not ruled by time. He created time. He lives in eternity. So from eternity, he can know the past time and the future time. It's like being in a helicopter above a parade. In a helicopter, you can see the beginning of the parade and you can see the end of the parade. The people in the middle of the parade can't see the beginning or the end, can they? We're bound by time, but God is in eternity. He can look down from eternity. He can see the past. He can see the future. He can see all of time spread out before him because he created it. How dare we put God in a box and impose our time scale on him and his actions because he dwells in eternity. He's not bound by time. What's God's description of the creation time frame? The word yom which equals a day, is used over 2,300 times in the Old Testament. So why does everyone question it only in Genesis? Only in Genesis. And in Exodus 20, we're reminded to remember the Sabbath day. Why? Because in six days, the Lord God made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all the demons rested on the seventh day. And that's repeated in Exodus chapter 31. Do you realize that? It's repeated for us, and we're told that these words were written with the finger of God on tablets of stone. You see, other parts of the scripture have been inspired by God, but Exodus 20 verse 11 has actually been written, inscribed by God. So if God can't be trusted to write exactly what he means in Exodus 20, can we trust what he says in John 3:16? I love this little cartoon. Six days, yep. Six truly really days, yep. You're sure it says six days? Yes. I wonder why it took so long. <laughs> you see, God could have done it in six, day, uh, six seconds, couldn't he? He could have done it in six million years. But he's told us how long he did it. He's told us. This is what Paddle Pun at Wheaton College says. It is apparent that the most straightforward understanding of the Genesis record Without regard to all the hermeneutical considerations suggested by science, 
is that God created the heaven and earth in six solar days, etc. The fall, the flood. You see what he's saying? That if you just read Genesis without regard to science, you'll come to the conclusion it was the six days. There was a literal curse and fall, fall and curse. There was a global flood. But as soon as you add the science, oh, the Bible's all wrong. And he's teaching at a Christian college. Human reasoning alone suggests the earth looks old because today's natural processes alone would have required billions of years to build the earth's rocks and landscapes. But this is an interpretation based on unprovable assumptions that the present is the key to the past. So is God deceiving us, as some claim, by creating a mature, vegetated earth, fully formed and fully functioning, yet only days old? He tells us that he created fruit trees already bearing fruit. Why? Because three days later, Adam and Eve would need to eat fruit. Why plant seeds and wait for them to grow? Adam and Eve would have gone hungry. You see, God tells us that the earth was only a little over five days old when Adam first walked on it, and Adam witnessed the sudden appearance of Eve. Yet, notice I use the words fully formed and fully functioning. I do not use the term appearance of age. Why? We must eradicate it from our vocabulary because age is an interpretation. To say that something has an appearance of age we're actually assuming, by human reasoning, natural processes alone. No, God created a fully functioning, mature universe. Just as Jesus, the Creator, did not deceive anyone when he turned the water into wine. In John chapter 2, the master of the feast deceived himself by assuming that this was wine that came from grapes that grew on vines. He forgot to ask the eyewitnesses, the servants, what they saw the miracle that Jesus did. So he deceived himself by using human reasoning except instead of using the eyewitnesses to verify where that wine had come from. Isn't that what so many people do today? What so many Christians do today? They talk to the scientists rather than going to God's word. You see, in the same way, we deceive ourselves when we ignore God's eyewitness account of creation and the flood. So what is at stake? What is at stake when we, when we compromise on the millions of years issue? This is what's at stake, at stake because the millions of years are in direct contradiction to the biblical account of where sin came from, where death came from, and why we need a saviour. You see, back in Genesis, we're given the bad news and then we're told the good news. That's why we have in the museum our last Adam theatre. Adam is there in the garden and we go through the museum, we come to the last Adam, who is Jesus Christ. Because he's the answer to man's problem that started back there in the Garden of Eden. And so the very gospel that we preach is rooted, the cross is rooted in the account in Genesis. As I said before, Genesis is the beginning of the history of Jesus Christ on this earth. But what does evolution teach? It teaches that Adam and Eve were already walking in a, a garden that had suffered from millions and billions of years of pain, death, suffering. The fossils, as I said before, are a record of death, a record of suffering. Evolution says over millions of years, death and struggle brought man into existence. The, the, the fossil record is a record of pain, death, disease, and suffering. You know what we're told came in at the curse? Were there thorns before the curse? Not on a biblical perspective. And yet, why do we find fossilized thorns that are supposedly 400 million years old? How could they come before man? You see, the fossil record has to come after the curse, after man, after the curse, which makes sense when you see it as from in the perspective of the flood. Martin Luther wrote, if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest expression every portion of the truth of the God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ. However boldly I may be professing, professing Christ. Where the battle rages, the loyalty of the soldier is proved, and to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. You see, friends, the church has missed the plot because it's not fighting the battle where the battle is really at. It's at this age of the earth issue. 
It's whether Noah's flood was a literal, global, catastrophic, year-long event. That's why this is crucial in our apologetics, in defending our faith and presenting the gospel. There is absolutely no doubt the edifice of evolution is built squarely on the foundation of millions and billions of years. Destroy that foundation of lots of time and the evolution edifice collapses. It is because of the millions and billions of years are, that are absolutely crucial to evolution and to the total undermining of the gospel, which it does, evolution undermines the gospel message that we preach. It undermines God's account of the true age and history. This is why this is such a controversial issue and the fiercest battleground. And if we give ground on the millions of years, we've lost the battle and we've lost the, the platform to preach the gospel. And we need to understand this. You see, Satan hasn't changed his tactics of doubt, deception, and opposition to God's word. He, he, today he's saying, did God really say in six days? Did God really mean six days? Did he really mean a catastrophic global year-long flood? He sows seeds of doubt, and he used his agents to deny, deliberately reject God's word that we've seen. That's why we must staunchly defend the truth of God's word from the very beginning and its true history of a young earth and global flood because it's so foundational to the gospel message we believe and preach. The geological evidence, therefore, is overwhelmingly consistent with the recent flood being a year-long global cataclysmic event. Saturate yourself with that evidence so you have a reason to be able to answer people the doubts about the millions of years. Remove that millions of years foundation and you can then present the gospel message to them. You see, because the 600 supposed million years worth of rock layers with fossils that were, that were formed during the flood, only, oh, sorry, were only formed during the flood four and a half thousand years ago, rather than all those supposed millions of years that can then be eliminated, when we believe the flood and present the evidence for the flood, we're eliminating those millions of years and destroying totally that foundation of evolution. This is why the geological evidence for the flood and the age of the earth is so crucial in our uh, apologetics arguments today because we are so faced with the evolution saturation, saturated global culture that we face today. After all, as I said before, if God's word can't be trusted as literal in Genesis, then how can we trust John 3, 16? The war over the flood and the age of the earth must be fought because the gospel message and the salvation of souls are at stake. Let me close with a personal, some challenge, challenges here. We must humbly submit to the authority of God's word, then our science conducted in the light of the scriptures always confirms what God's word says. Peter left us with a challenge. He said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us would not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why he hesitates to come in judgment today. But the day of the Lord will come. As sure as the sun will rise tomorrow, God will come in judgment. God will have the last stay. The scoffers will be defeated. We are on the winning side. But he says this, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conduct and godliness? You see, there's a personal challenge. Now you know these things, what are you going to do about it? One day we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account. What are we going to say when we stand before our Creator on Judgment Day? What are we going to say that what we did with our lives? Did you really, he'll say, did you really believe my word? You know, sadly, so many Christians and so many Christian academics choose man's knowledge, fear man rather than God. They forget that God says that the big fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Friends, and please don't take this the wrong way. I would rather suffer the scorn of academics for 70 years in this life because I've stood on the authority of God's word and know that when I get to eternity, hopefully I'll get thou well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in the joy of thy Lord. What are so many Christian academics going to say to God on judgment day about the millions of years they've taught their students to make them disbelieve God's word? Friends, and I close, 
Do we really believe on the authority of God's word that the ungodly will perish in the coming everlasting judgment? If we do, then we will tirelessly labor for our Lord and Savior who gave his all for us so that we can see lost sinners come to repentance by our witnessing to the truth and authority of God's word, the ultimate one who is God's word, Jesus Christ himself, our creator and Lord and soon coming King. Amen. 